you very much for the invitation to come all the way to uh, Sao Paulo today from Copenhagen. Um, we've talked about today all the problems that cities uh, apparently are accumulating, but I would like to make a point today that cities, and especially public spaces in cities, are an underutilized health resource for us. Design of cities uh, affects our behavior. And uh, we have research uh, into this aspect many times. Actually, I would say that we as people, we are very basic creatures. We, we tend to think that we are very intelligent animals, but in fact, we act according to the invitations that we get. And a lot of our built environment is, as in this picture, inviting us to a very unsustainable behavior. Actually, as people, we think a lot about how can we m be most efficient with our energy and how can we use the more comfortable way of moving ourselves, our body. So, of course, in this image, people use the escalator and not the, the stairs. I would also say that culture is not necessarily static or as static as we would like it to, to, to be. In fact, we as people are adapting to our environment very much. Um, a lot of places or all the different cities I come to in the world, every city would say, no, 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 Helle, we cannot, we, 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 don't, we don't cycle in our city, it's not part of our culture. Or in Copenhagen they would say, no, we never sit outside and drink coffee, that's what they do in Italy. But, but I, I would in fact say that we as people, we, we, we adopt our culture to, to the environment that is here. So we need to, in fact, talk about how to change the environment in order to change behavior. And that, that's when I come to the point that we seem to know a lot as researchers about different types of habitats, especially for, for, for animals. Like uh, here in Brazil, you are very concerned about the turtles on the beach, for example. You know everything about the type of food they want and the, 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 type, the type of breathing places and so forth. But what about people? What is the type of habitat that we like as people? What do we need? I'm not talking about the basic stuff like water and, and safety and those types of things. We know that. But what are the qualities that can make us behave differently? Those are the qualitative aspects that I would like to know a little bit more of. How do we, for example, invite for this walking animal to really be an active uh, participants in our in our cities how do cities build and support people's needs both our social needs that we actually need to meet with other people but also our our physical needs the way we orient the the way we use our sight uh, we need a lot of stimuli every fourth second our brain needs something new and and some new experience in order to feel that we can be invited to walk through the streets I think any one of the nurses and doctors in this room would probably be, um, be, be, be saying that um, to, to, to live a healthy life, we need fresh air, we need exercise, and we need to meet other people. Those are the three basic things that makes us healthy. And yet, we make it so difficult in our urban environment. Poor pedestrian conditions, really trafficated streets, and lack of human scale. And those three images that I'm showing here are not from Sao Paulo, Paulo all of them. Some of one, of one from, was from Dubai and another one from, 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 from China. This is a phenomenon that is uh, causing problems all over the globe today. This image from Mexico City, people are using two and a half hours in average on transport every day, as many people do here in Sao Paulo. And it has a massive effect on our health. We look at the obesity rates for adults along, uh, in, in many our uh, countries around the world. Mexico, Mexico comes in second after the US. And the obesity rates exactly follow the number of kilometers driven in cars in the major cities today. If we look at Brazil, Actually, there are research uh, reports showing that Brazil's obesity rate will, will, could, could potentially reach the ones of the US by 2020, being more than a third of the population. 
We also look at city life that takes a toll on Sao Paulo's residents, and 30% report a mental disorder, according to WHO. Homicides and traffic accidents, we've talked about that earlier today, that it, it co it, it's over 60% of all deaths in Brazil. And I'm showing these things to say that all of those aspects, they deal with time and how we use our time in space. The life that takes place between the buildings. And that should really be our focus. If we look at how life between buildings has changed over the course of time, we can see that earlier there was a lot of necessary activities happening in our cities. A lot of things was shared. We, uh, we, we went to the marketplace, uh, we shared, uh, we, we washed our clothes uh, the same place. Now, a lot of the activities that are taking place in cities are recreational. Um, a lot of the, the activities that used to be shared are now private. We look at, we work from home, we look at movies from home, we wash our clothes at home and so, and so forth. Some of those recreational activities are optional activities. If the city is not offering a nice environment, people tend to go to the shopping mall or go to someplace else where they actually find that they can have a relaxed time. Now, I'm thinking that because of all those health issues that we have today, some of those recreational activities, being, being active in terms of sport and so forth, is actually becoming once again necessary for us necessary in terms of keeping our health and running for our lives. We tend to measure what we care about in cities. Every city has, like a, a good business, key performance indi indicators that we are measuring. We tend to measure traffic growth, we measure economic growth, population growth, and a lot of other quantitative elements in cities. But are we simply optimizing the wrong things? What about life? Why don't, don't any cities actually calculate pedestrians? Does Sao Paulo have pedestrian numbers? Do we know how people move about? Do we know enough about people mobility, soft mobility, or active transport, as we could call it? How do we, in fact, measure happiness and quality of life? Walking is good for your health. Actually, reports are showing that the people that live an active life live longer. Only two times 30 minutes of exercise every day will result in a seven-year longer lifespan. Cycling is good for your health as well. People that cycle or take their cycle to work every day have a 28% lower mortality rate than the, the average population. Those are some of the health, health results that we know of. So what I would say is that we can invite health through design. I'm giving an example of Copenhagen because it's my home city. And I know it's very different from Sao Paulo, but I think even so, Sao Paulo can be inspired by a small city like Copenhagen. Copenhagen has used its, uh, or developed its, its bicycle network over a period of 30 years, 40 years. And today we really have a complete system of uh, streets that accommodate walking and cycling. As you see in these images, uh, people or the, the, the sidewalks and the, and the cycle lanes or cycle tracks are taking across the side streets to really show priority to the people that are walking. We have green waves as you would normally have for cars, we have that for cyclists. So if you cycle between certain hours and keep a speed of 20 kilometers an hour, you can actually cycle with a green wave through the city. Cycle tracks are very, very efficient. According to the municipality of Copenhagen, uh, a cycle track can actually take five times as many people as, uh, as a normal traffic lane. However, to me, the most important thing about cycling and walking is not the efficiency, but the fact that cities that have a lot of people cycling and walking have people on the streets. It becomes a different environment, much more people-oriented, not the, not the people sitting in their, their metal boxes. Walking and cycling is about equity. 
we can all do it. In fact, I would argue that we are all pedestrians. You might take your car, you might use the bus, you might even cycle to work, but the minute you park that, that mode of transportation, you become a pedestrian. Urban cycling is not Tour de France. This is uh, me on my way to, to work uh, uh, on a normal day or in the weekend on the way to the park. Copenhagen has not just introduced walking and cycling systems, but also implemented a series of different types of parks in the city for our sport activities and for young people and for our mental health as well. It's not about moving all the time, but also just relaxing and spending time outside. Different types of activities, parkour, skateboarding uh, areas and so forth are finding its way to the city, temporary spaces, in, in, in old industrial areas so that can, you can find new experiences in the city all the time. And a new beach park, which I think is fabulous because it's not a commercial place. Uh, it's not a, a, a cafe street or a cafe ladder area or a downtown space. This is a parks project where people can actually go and they can run and they can skateboard. And it has become so fabulous uh, that people even go there to get married. Copenhagen modal split, after a con con consistent work in this area for many years now, Copenhagen have a remarkable modal split compared to other cities in the world. 35% of everybody cycle, cycle to work. And actually 55% of everybody cycles to work in the inner city. That's more than half of the population. 70% continues cycling at winter time. And that is not because we in the north are special species or very different from you guys here in Sao Paulo. Or we have special blood running in our veins. You know that as doctors. No, we cycle because it is easy. If you ask people, why do you cycle? Only 9% would say that they do it to save the planet. They do, they do it for the environment. 88% will answer, they do it because it's easy and quick. So that speaks to why I started this talk. We are very basic creatures. We respond to the invitations we get and to the level of, of comfort that we can find in that system. So Sao Paulo should start inviting for different modes of transportation. Cycling and walking also makes sense in terms of economy. In fact, the city center or the, the municipality of Copenhagen has proven that they earn 1.2 kroner equivalent of 0 0.5 uh, 445 um, Brazilian real, and they lose money on driven kilometers. And that's because of the health benefits that we can actually calculate from the time that people spend on their bicycle rather than in the hospitals. We can also see that on the bicycle infrastructure that we build, bridges and tracks and so forth, we actually earn a profit of more than 12%. And the state of Denmark is requiring a minimum of 5% earnings. So investing in, in walking and bicycling infrastructure is phenomenal. More and more cities, in fact, are being inspired of these different innovative uh, measures and results that Copenhagen has, uh, has achieved over the years. We had a visit uh, in, in our office and in, in Copenhagen by Amanda Burden and um, Janet Sedikan from New York back in 2007, and we took them bicycling around the city. And they went back to uh, New York and were inspired by the Copenhagen bicycle lanes and they were phenomenal in change and managing change over the, over the last five years in New York. In only a couple of months, they implemented this bike lane on Ninth Avenue as a pilot project. Broadway became a, a, a series of bi uh, pilot projects, taking space away from cars, inviting for innovative walking and cycling uh, routes. And, and this is really about testing the design of our urban habitat. Who has the right to our shared public space? 
How can we design our public spaces differently to impact behavior and start an urban sustainable culture? This is what New York has been so inspirational for all other cities in doing. And, and we helped them also do an evaluation report about these changes. And that evaluation report, testing before and after, 11% increase in pedestrian numbers, 63% decrease in injuries, 84% increase in stationary activities, meaning people just coming there because it was a wonderful place to be, and more than 74% of everybody saying that this was a remarkable improvement for the area. I would recommend everybody to tap into our urban health resource. I think we need to go from hospitals to hospitality. Cities need to be much more about hospitality. In fact, I would say we have three teachers through our life. Our parents, if we are so lucky that we have close parents, the next one is our teachers and professors in school that, that teach us how to be citizens and, and how to learn. But the third teacher is the city. It's the environment. We learn from being in the city. We learn from meeting each other. We learn from how to take the bus, how to buy the ticket, how to interact, how to actually be together as a culture, as citizens. Our public spaces is an urban health resource. It's about how to design those spaces so that we can really feel invited to do the right thing. People are not stupid. People react to what they can actually do. I think a healthy city contains and focuses on three different things, as I have tried to illustrate from Copenhagen and New York. Culture. Don't focus on traffic, don't focus on efficiency, don't focus on where you can build the next museum. Focus on how you can support culture in the city and how you can make a sustainable behavior with people. Focus on attractiveness, and by that I don't mean fancy design and nice aesthetics or nice, uh, nice materials. I mean attractiveness as understood by us as, as people in terms of behavior and our social needs. And innovation. The public spaces is where we meet each other. It's where we meet the strange, the things we don't know. And that's where we can create meeting places. And we can understand new ways of living and we can learn from each other and develop new lifestyles. All of this actually sums up in a very easy or very straightforward uh, sort of learning sentence or methodology or approach, you could say, we need to shift our way of planning so that we can place people and people's needs in that center of planning. And if we can do that, we can, we can um, hit five, bo five birds uh, with one stone, so to speak. We can make the cities more healthy, more attractive, more sustainable, more safe, and more economic sound. So this is not a question about size of city. This is not a question of systems oriented. This is about prioritizing people, public life, and livability in public spaces. Thank you.